his presentation will be very much different from anything you heard before and very much different from anything uh, you may have heard in the previous years of this class. So instead of uh, looking on either electronic or nuclear degrees of freedom, he will look on to spin degrees of freedom. My name is Stephen Rostrin, and I'm going to start with Dylan. Said I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom. So we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Do, do, do we need to launch uh, the presentation mode? Oh, right, right, right. You can't tell. I'm a little nervous. All, okay. I've, all I've had to eat today is coffee. <laughs> so you can take. If you are not in the good mood to all the. Hello? Uh, yeah. Can you all hear me now? Yep. Yep. So, my name is Steve Rusher, and as Dr. Kellen said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom in electrons, and specifically the free induction decay of electrons and electrons in NMR. So, first, uh, we're going to have to cover some theory, since, as I said, mine is very different from everyone else's. So, that would be what exactly is spin? And that is a very hard question. <laughs> If it wasn't, I'd probably have a Nobel Prize winner. So it's an intrinsic property of electrons and other fundamental particles, which doesn't really tell us anything. It's uh, more actually, it's a form of angular momentum of a particle. And probably the analogy: it's a ball that's spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. So then, what is it? Well, specifically, the spin number of an electron is the eigenvalue of a wave equation for the k number of states where the wave function is an eigenfunction of s hat z for the summation of k terms of s hat z k. So that would be the, uh, basically the z uh, value for a, uh, a vector of uh, magnetization, basically. So that allows us to see that they'd be represented by a sphere, basically. That would be a block sphere. Well, what is a block sphere? It's a geometric, geometric representation of a qubit where the poles of the sphere represent the 0 and 1 states. Uh, more usefully, it's a way of visualizing the magnetic vector of a spinning electron as it moves uh, through a magnetic field. So we have our magnetic vector is equal to uh, g, su summation of k of the sk of time t, where the sk is the combination of the x, y, and z components of the vector, which are controlled by uh, these uh, equations, which I will show later. So, now what is a spin echo? So, as the magnetic moments of a, a group of electrons move around a block sphere, on, around the equator, that at one point in time, they will synchronize and constructively combine their signals into one very large signal. Now, the exact time that this happens for an atom is unique to each atom and to each electronic environment, or so how it's bonded uh, for every single state that there can be. This is the principle behind how NMR spectroscopy can differentiate elements and atomic structure this way. And now we have a very, very messy graph. So what's happening on this graph is that all of our uh, electrons in the magnetic moment in the ensemble start at the same level the uh, pulse, the half pi magnetic pulse that brings the electrons from the poles of the, mag of the block sphere onto the equator, which is represented by these two lines, at which point the varying uh, individual frequencies that they move around the equator, uh, which is dependent on their individual electronic environment, cause them to diverge into these various uh, purple and yellow orange lines until they reach the pi pulse which uh, flips them 180 degrees in the sphere. And as you can see, that changes the way so that now instead of diverging away from one point on the sphere, they are now on the opposite side, converging towards a separate point on the opposite side, which is represented here and here. And so we have two identical signals, despite the fact that they are now in different places in time and space. And so a more 
useful visual aid, Jason, if you can't really wrap your head around that. We have our electrons here at the top of the block sphere, which are then moved to the equator by the 90 degree or half pi pulse, so that they are now in the xy plane of the sphere. They then proceed, the various uh, electrons, since this is more than one, move in various ways around the sphere at different rates, and that's such they uh, counteract and destructively combine to reduce the total of the signal that you would see. This is until the pi pulses uh, received by them, at which point they flip to the opposite side of where their positions were originally on the sphere, and they now begin to converge to a single point on the opposite side of the sphere. So, a nice thing I got from Wikipedia shows this in a smooth motion. Mm -hmm. And you see that at one point they converge on the opposite side and uh, form a new signal even though that there shouldn't be any uh, magnetization present. Now what did I do exactly? Well, as the electrons move, they move at different rates. The, specifically it's called the, uh, dis the disorder is the variance between uh, each individual magnetic moment as it moves. So, as stated earlier, they are defined by the summation of the x, y, and z coordinates, which are defined by various differential equations. The important uh, variable in this is the plus or minus i, delta, omega, k. They do so at different rates. The difference between those is defined by the delta, omega, k. So here are the two electrons, not the, the two formulas that I used earlier in the uh, formula to divine, define the uh, magnetic vector. And here we have the delta uh, omega k uh, components, which are the important factors. So in the MATLAB code, delta omega k is represented as a multiple of omega. As you can see here, the original was uh, 0.015, where this can be, rep x represents any uh, value that would differentiate between the different uh, speeds that they move. With x is uh, starting at 0.01 in 0.025 increments uh, up to uh, 0.02. So what does that look like? So here we see the signal that you would receive on the block sphere, where as they move around the uh, equator at different rates, they destructively uh, counteract each other's signal until they converge at a single point and we see a sudden surge in signal on the opposite side. Now, graphed to link to the YouTube video that uh, Dr. Killen helped me put together, oh, that I took that from. If we graph that, we see this sort of graph, where the, uh, the orange and blue line combined represent the uh, measured magnetic signal. Now, as you can see, as disorder increases, this is uh, 0.01, uh, 0.0125, 0.015, and increasing so on to 0.02, the uh, width of the peak increasingly narrows the larger the disorder is between them. So this is a very important as uh, the width of the peak uh, is a limitation in the resolution ability of an NMR to distinguish different uh, electronic states. So if we draft that as a combination of the area of the peak over the multiples of W, we see this very smooth uh, sloping uh, trend line as the disorder of, uh, of the state of the magnetic moments increases. And the, it says T2. I'm sorry, I did not uh, define what that is. T2 is the relaxation time, the time that it takes for an electron that's been put through a magnetic uh, field and been brought to the XY plane to return to its initial uh, sort of state after it's removed from the electronic field. This uh, value is different for every uh, element and is part of the, the way that spin echo is used as a way of uh, determining the, the state of the atom. So what happens if we make the disorder really, really large, like seven times as large as the original one that uh, we started with? And something very interesting happens. The total area of the peak completely breaks down and the, it loses all symmetry. There's no symmetrical large peaks on either side. And what I'd speculate about what's causing this at this point <coughs> is that the disorder is so large between each individual magnetic moment 
that they aren't able to uh, immediately constructively rephase into a single point. By the time the first ones are rephasing, the other electron magnetic moments are still far around the sphere, and by the time the last ones are rephasing, the first ones have already returned to their initial values. Question? Okay, but thanks, Stephen. Now we have 10 minutes. <laughs> and presentation is open for discussion. Yes. You mentioned that this is kind of applicable to the NMR spectroscopy. Yes. But then you were also talking about, like initially, I think you said it several times, that you talk about spin of an electron. What is used in NMR? What kind of spin they use? Is it for electrons or for something different? I might have confused some there. But the important part is that. Uh, so. <laughs> It doesn't change the overall, I'll say, physics and uh, formulas which you were showing. Algebraic processing. In an atom, are there any cells which have spin, or oh, it's only electrons which do have spin? It's what about protons? All uh, elementary particles and quarks have spin. However, in the nucleus of an atom, they believe they are counteracting. Is proton a fermion or not? No. Pro a proton? A single proton? Yes. <laughs> Proton is a fermion, right? But if if, yes. if you if, if you talk about nucleus, right, depends on whether you have even or odd numbers, and they might be not fermions. So in NMR, it's the same idea, but my understanding is that they talk about the spin of the nucleus, spin of the protons. So in in your talk, you can uh, replace only one letter if you want to speak about electrons instead of NMR, or EPR. EPR, yes. No. More questions to Steven? If not, then thank you once again. Please don't leave it here. So the uh, next presentation uh, is by John Swanson. So um, his presentation will be also very unlike and similar to anything you heard before. In the uh, recent uh, year, or a couple of years, there was an interest to uh, so-called two-dimensional quantum materials, and uh, John was brave enough to try to apply uh, skills from the course for uh, exotic materials. Are you in a mood to speak loud, or you need to... I'd rather you speak loud. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is John Swanson. I will be presenting on the correlation between eigenstates as the magnetic field is changed. Um, so getting into that, um, just brief overview, not that people don't know what superconductors are, but a uh, superconductor is a material which can move electrons from one atom to the next with no resistance. And so this is often researched on low temperatures, bringing metals down to low temperatures, they can become superconductors in many cases. Um, but one area of research that maybe isn't as looked into or known about is the application of magnetic fields um, to form superconductors and metals. Because I know metals oftentimes, when they are superconductors, give off magnetic fields, but inducing them with a magnetic field may have um, a similar result to bringing it to lower temperatures if we look into that a bit. So, some basic methods of research. Um, there's a MATLAB code that was used to do this experimentation. I'll get a little bit into what was behind that. And so through this, we um, took the eigenstates that were found through this code, and they were converted to density of states um, across energy. And then that was used to determine if a superconductor could be formed based on how the density of states um, reacted. And so some equations that were helpful in doing this um, this first equation relates the Hamiltonian to energy in the eigenstates. Um, and a lot of these are really intertwined, so actually doing this computationally may be incredibly challenging, which is why a code was used, because I'm not sure I could do any of this by hand. Um, second one equation right here, we found, um, use the energy found in the first equation um, and use it in the first equation to find the density of states. And then moving past that, this equation is used alongside this, once this is solved, and it can be plugged back in, as you can see here, and then this is just an equation for the Hamiltonian with L sub Z being 
angular momentum, v sub z being um, magnetic field, and both of these are actually in the um, momentum um, space and not in any position. position. Yes. Thank you. What is LU and H of? Okay, so LU is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, highest occupied. And so for this one, lowest is um, calculated using positive, highest using negative. So, and so a little bit of a representation of this last code here. Um, this is this cone is kind of what that equation looks like when mapped out in again in the momentum space. And this ky and kx are represented as px and py here. Um, and so the top is the lowest unoccupied, bottom is the highest occupied, um, corresponding to positive and negative. And then this over here is a material that this could be um, researched upon. So this is the top. This is a lot of layered on business telluride, and it's just one of the um, lattices of that. And so this is something that the experimentation done could be done upon. Okay, so for the actual data, um, at the bottom here, the areas are the eigenstates um, across energy that were found through the experimentation. And above each of these um, is a corresponding density of states that were found um, when converted. So these first three, this is throughout the slides I'll show. This is as the magnetic field increases. And these first three are pretty similar. As you can see, this is the density of states um, of the holes where there weren't electrons in the uh, lattice and then of the electrons found. And the dotted line you'll see is the combination of the two of those. So nothing really too interesting here. Um, as the magnetic field is increased even more, um, it was starting to see that there was a bit of a dip here, which started to grow, as you can see in that last one, almost forming a peak. Um, and then finally, uh, here we can see this is the strongest peak that was found through this experimentation. I'm sure it could be found stronger if you were to get to closer values, but this is what was found. Um, and then it started to dip down. And so what was determined from seeing this peak in the density of states is that it is evidence for a superconductor. Um, I believe you can look at, look at Fermi's golden rule for showing that when the density of states increases at a specific energy um, so sharply it could indicate that a superconductor is being formed. And so again, it, it flattens out afterwards, but that is as a magnetic field is increased, that is something that is known to happen for density of states. So that doesn't prove this is true, but it gives further evidence that this is reliable. Um, and so this is just a video of all of those kind of mapped out, kind of what that would look like just for a little bit of a better visualization of the density of states over time. OK, so some observations that could be made here. Again, by Fermi's golden rule, um, we can claim that as density of states increase at one specific energy, that um, you could maybe see a superconductor being formed. And so um, further indication of this was found when looking at the eigenstates of the found through this experimentation. And so I'm not going to show all of them because there's a lot, but um, I picked a specific few. So when the B field is zero, uh, I believe this is the first eigenstate and the third one, um, according to our graphs on an earlier slide. Um, there's relatively little to see here, which indicates there's little motion. And so as we move up in the magnetic field, this should be um, negative 2.33 times 10 to negative 5. Um, there is a lot more fringes here, as seen by the second eigenstate and the fifth one, that's why I believe these two are, and the fringes should indicate that there's further motion within these eigenstates, and that continues up to um, negative four times 10 to the negative five, um, and this is at a much higher energy and a much lower energy, but as you can see, there is a lot of um, activity going on there, which further indicates that there is motion which would 
lead you to believe that maybe a superconductor could be formed under these conditions. A second. So yeah. this is just different eigenstates at the same um, uh, at the same magnetic field, right? You no, fix no. the strength, so, you, so or you're changing it. This this is magnetic field is zero. This is increased to two point three three times seven. Which is kind of optimal, where you really see yeah. the formation. Of and then the the largest peak was seen at this one, um, and so this is at a higher energy. But this is as the magnetic field is increased. This is just a couple of the eigenstates take it out of that. Okay. And so observations, again, I said, as it fringes increase, that we just believe that there's an increase in motion. Um, and there are the eigenstates, and my units are not quite great. But they're there. Can't change them now. Um, and so basically what I took out of this is upon induction of a magnetic field, it could lead us to believe that a superconductor could be formed under the right conditions, which I think is something that's very interesting. So thank you. Yes, I'm questions. Yes. Sorry, I'm in front of the students in my question. Oh, no. <laughs> well, you're, you're ready to upload the infinity. Okay, Alyssa. Um, can you go back to, uh, just keep going, I'll tell you this Okay, uh, right here. Yes. Um, so on the first one uh, that you have, why are the states less one? Why is like, it keep going up? There's like, obviously not like plateaus. Do you know like why it gets so weird? Like, you mean with? Um, nope, the bottom graph. Here? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, because they're not. So this dip, um, I know I looked into it at some point. Um, I think it indicates a change in the motion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm not entirely sure why it goes from, you know, the tears to that kind of steadily increasing pattern. But I guess they're just because the eigenstates would probably be taken from different spots that aren't necessarily in one um, plane um, because the eigenstates are kind of correlating to this conic shape. Um, but I could be mistaken in that. Uh, great question and, and answer is almost complete. <laughs> Can you uh, uh, indicate our attention to magnetic field equals zero? And uh, count how many uh, degenerate eigenstates you see if you start from lowest? Here? Yeah, no degeneracy for the lowest. And next one, how Four. many? How many? Four. How many? Four. Four. Yes. OK, now let's go to your eigenstates at the very end. I mean, here. Eigenstates, not uh, the. Oh, I see. Yeah. The, yeah. So, um, can you explain how this degeneracy one and four relate to uh, your eigenstates with zero field? Hmm. So this is at zero energy. Um, zero magnetic field. Zero, thank you. And zero, zero magnetic field. And so um, at the degeneracy of one and four, you can see that both of these are, um, well, they're basically the same, at least in this, which oh. indicates that both state there's little interaction but I'm not exactly um, sure that's what you're getting at. Does momentum uh, he, he's on the right way. We, we, we will complete this one. And thank you much Elisa for for great question. Um is momentum changing or conserved in absence of magnetic field? It appears to be conserved. Conserved. So uh, if you create a state with very certain value of momentum, delta function of momentum, is there any mechanism to, to disturb it? No. No. So uh, on your grid points for different values of momentum, please keep, keep this uh, again. On uh, any value of grid point, the delta function certifying very specific value of momentum will be an eigenstate because there are no reasons to change eigenstate. Right? And uh, if you take uh, square lattice grid points, how many nearest neighbors are close to point zero? You, you already answered that. Let's uh, focus on the 
бэк. How many closes neighbor to this point along this grid grid lines? One, two, three, four. In all of them, you have the same value of uh, energy because it is proportional to those numbers. So it's four degrees. And if you despite it is uh, one degrees, one degrees. Can we go back to your uh, degeneracy images? This probably kills you. And can you maybe? But yeah, can you now uh, repeat the same to Alisa and pointing right uh, things on there? I can do my best. So here, um, momentum is conserved as we go across, and so the closest four um, are seen up here. To what was your question? You because your question, <laughs> your question was one. more based your on question was why it's so smooth. Yeah, on on this one. Rather than well, um, and then it goes this. back to being like when it goes back to deep, it goes back to being normal again. I guess I I don't I was just wondering if there's like a, a reason why it goes there. from I, I get exactly what you're asking why it goes from the tears to kind of a more curved pattern and then back to the tears again because of the discrete nature of, of grid points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it could be a numerical artifact. If we take finer grid points, it may disappear. More work. Yes. All right, can you get back to this slide with a picture of Bismarck Telluride? Yes, for sure. So Bismarck Telluride is a narrow Vanguard cement bedroom. Vanguard is our 0.1 something, 11 points. So on the other left, you show something which is more like metal, more like graphene. And I didn't see any Vanguard in the house. So do you think that your model on the left can be applicable to the material on the right? I think a similar model might be, but maybe not this specific one. Um, this is more of an example of something that has been used with superconductors that this may be able to be applied for, because I know this has been used to insulate and make quantum computers with um, just some research that has recently been done. But I'm not sure if this exact model would be I mean, the whole idea is uh, you, know, you can use a uh, magnetic field to manipulate the electronic state in the Vanguard uh, Vanguard for example. So, um, okay, then that's it. Okay, my question is very simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know of any example of real material where they observe, um, you know, uh, superconductivity by, by applying uh, the magnetic field? In my research, I could not find anywhere that this was um, observed in any material, but um, this was more just to show that maybe it could be found to be applied to some material, but um, I could not find any evidence of a material that has been shown to have that um, functionality yet. Uh, have you seen an opposite effect when increase of magnetic field so limits the conductivity? Like your regime when you keep increasing it higher yeah. values. Well, um, eventually, like if you look <coughs> here, um, as the magnetic field is continually increased, eventually it does start to it, it lowers the conductivity. Lower the conductivity. This this is very standard effect of certain experiment. So half of these results agree with experiment. Okay. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> the other half is more the the part that would be interesting to put further research into based on this evidence. I don't know, typically in my is, um, you know, when you have enhanced, uh, the enhancement of the electronic, um, electronic, electronic studies at the factory level, it may lead to superconductivity. But yes, you know, it doesn't mean that if you have enhancement, yeah, you have to have a conductor. Right? It, yeah. You may have it. Yes. Okay. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah, that's yeah, right. More questions to John? I have a general question, which is kind of related. Oh, I would say the answer to my question was already answered mm -hmm. in a question from Han, uh, uh, Khan. And um, so technically, this Bismuth telluride, right? So it's referred to the so-called Dirac materials because uh, it's not small semiconductor, it's a Dirac materials, means 
they completely close the gap at one point, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what other materials do you know which behave in the same way? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, and anyone from audience may uh, help to answer this question. It takes longer time. I do not know of any names directly. You should. Um, I should. This is very common material. I would be very surprised the, if you have never layers? seen it. Because I know graphene works in Yeah, this is one. This is the most common one, right? Yeah. So, uh, but there are, of course, more than one yeah. material like that. And technically, the computational chemistry was applied to create some kind of a prediction. So, database, they tried to go through many variations of possible semiconductors of multiple combinations, metal, non metals, yeah. whatever, and calculating electronic structure, the, the, the dependence energy on the band, uh, on a, on a yeah, on the key points and checking whether you can get the uh, direct materials or not. And yeah, we found about hundreds of materials as predicted. Some of them not synthesized yet. More questions to John? If no, please uh, join me in uh, <laughs> and uh, last uh, note that uh, probably all visitors will agree that uh, it was a successful presentation. Please submit if you did this uh, form and class that attendees can also do this. Um, so the exposure of uh, class attendees to unbiased uh, problems was a chance to practice your knowledge in more real life environment. And uh, there is a hope that it will um, help to keep part of the knowledge more um, long lasting in your memories, and it will eventually help in uh, your in other classes, like in organic PCM2, uh, computational chemistry, which all you are invited to take, and uh, in your academic teaching or industrial careers. With this, uh, let me thank uh, all speakers and uh, participants of the discussion. Yes. So may I just make a comment, because I was coming for, uh, Dmitry is teaching this course for about four, four times already, right, for three. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was, I was coming for this presentation of students from previous mm -hmm. years, at least four, I think it was four times already. And mm -hmm. I really was amazed with your presentations as a group, because usually, yeah, there are of course good presentations, very good presentations, but there are really presentations which are kind of very weak and very, people don't know what they do, we don't know how to ask questions. I was very, very pleased to see that all how many eight people who were presenting really showing very, very good understanding, level of understanding was very high and overall presentations were just interesting to listen to you. It was interesting to see what you were doing. So really, I think as a group, every of you was really, I don't know, I, I have, I'm very excited Seeing your presentations, really great work, guys. Okay. And this, uh, with this meeting is dismissed, <laughs> and class is complete. <laughs> so I think I mean, I forgot to say that I, I you know, fully agree with Stalana. I'm really impressed with you guys uh, from the end of the day since here. Um, uh, you know, it's much better than any other event that I. Um, yeah, be proud of yourself. And, yeah, lots of improvement. We are yeah. proud of you. <laughs> yeah, great job. For whatever reason, like it builds up speed, and when you drift out the side, it's like. Oh, this one. Yeah, so it's like expands. So you walk in the class, and it's like this guy, like, hot, and off you it was seven, but I consider eight is my number.
Thank you, Dr. Han. I really appreciate your support. The code did it. Also, I have an answer to your question. Um, oh, yeah. there's like, um, so, it's, well, you were asking about the different from and there's parallel and so one of them has I haven't. So like that's how it works. So it's it was in my preparation. I think it's just so cheap. Um, it's like it's like a like 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 it's a it's a tough yeah. 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 Well, I'll see you next semester.